Hello everyone and due to popular demand I thought it was about time that I started looking at the OWASP top 10 again and specifically I want to take a look at the 2017 release of the OWASP top 10 which took a little while to actually um, to kind of be approved I think it ended up going into 2018 which we'll talk about a bit later on and I want to talk a little bit about what is the OWASP top 10 and why it's useful. So just a, a little bit about me. My name is Luke and I'm based in Cheltenham in the UK and I am the founder of Cotswold IT Consulting, something which I've done recently after being the CTO of a software startup. So I've been reasonably heavily involved in web application security and in the cloud and also a contributor to some of the OWASP topics. And this is really just a series of videos to help you understand something which probably reads OK on paper, but something that sounds a bit easier to understand when somebody says it instead. So let's start with OWASP itself. What is OWASP? Well, effectively, if we say it backwards, then we'll work out what it is. The OWASP is a project, a security project to do with web applications and that is open. So it's the Open Web Application Security Project. It kind of explains what it is. But what does open mean in this sense? Well, open means a number of things. It means that OWASP is primarily run by volunteers. It is a worldwide nonprofit organization. So there are chapters or, or meetups in lots of different countries around the world. The head kind of headquarters is based in the USA. But to all intents and purposes, it's not a, a location dependent organization, but it attempts to be global. And when I say attempts, <laughs> as in it, it wants to be global, and in many and in many cases it is. It tries to remain as far as possible vendor neutral. So in order for OWASP and the information that they produce to be trustworthy, we have to believe that it is independent data that's based on the facts and not based on whoever is trying to sell us something. So there are a number of rules in the OWASP uh, chapter, in the OWASP um, constitution, which describe how to remain vendor neutral. So even if something gets sponsored, it has to be very clear that the sponsorship is not to do with the information in the presentation and that the information itself is trustworthy. Clearly, some of the contributors include vendors. A lot of the data that forms the backbone of the OWASP top 10 comes from a relatively small number of companies who do this for their business. And effectively, what they're doing is saying, well, here's the data that we have on how common these vulnerabilities are. So please use this information to produce an open set of data which people around the world can use to make their web applications more safe, more secure. Anyone can take part, and that really does mean anybody. There are a number of GitHub projects for various parts of OWASP. They are generally open to new ideas, new facilities, but as with most of these things, it's really about getting enough momentum so the thing can be maintained. So there are a number of, uh, I guess, products that OWASP have produced in the past, which haven't really seen much kind of work done on them in the, in the past kind of couple of years which is a shame maybe that's just because they're not really needed anymore but as with a lot of open source work it's very easy to consume this information and not always the kind of thing that we give our own time and our own effort and our own help to make this thing carry on so you know please be encouraged to take part you can be involved in translation um, even if you you know you don't have the technical skills to to do other things, but there's plenty of things you can do. The information is free, and that's kind of important as well. In order for it to be usable, we want people to have to, to be able to access the information for free. And really, OWASP want this to be the central resource for web application security. And this is one thing that kind of is is a bit of a bugbear for me, a bit of a problem for me because I think the industry is doing things in so many different ways that it can be a very confusing picture for people who are trying to understand and to learn about security. So you can go to a, a, an industry organization like ISC or Isica or the you know Cloud Security Alliance and people like that. They each have their own aims and motivations. 
although they're not necessarily driven purely for profit, clearly there's money changing hands. And so that maybe changes the, the way they might do some things. And then at the same time, you have governments producing kind of national infrastructure projects, national security guidelines. You have universities and colleges with all the academic kind of training. You have industry experts, you have books, you have so much information out there. So, you know, as much as possible, we would like OWASP, OWASP to be that central resource so that that's the starting point for jumping off onto anything else. Now, this uh, link here on the OWASP top 10 is the link to the page, which has the PDF on it. Really highly recommend that you go and read that document. It's very readable. It's not particularly long to understand. It goes through most of what I'm talking about in this introduction video and goes into more detail just, so, you know, in case you're interested. But it explains all of the, the top 10 vulnerabilities in more detail than I'll probably go into them. But clearly, it's only a PDF document. It's not going to show you examples, which is something that I want to do in the, the subsequent videos to this, but please go and kind of visit that. So what, what is the top 10? Maybe a, a silly question. Some of you will already know what it is, but it's really a list of the biggest risks in web, app, web application security. So we're talking generally about risk. We're talking about vulnerabilities. And as I mentioned earlier, these are vulnerabilities that commercial companies have found in their work and that I've kind of submitted in data tables so that we can tabulate the data and say, well, out of, you know, 10,000, 100,000 applications, whatever the number is around the world that have been independently tested or code reviewed, we have found X percent of them have a particular vulnerability. So that information is useful because that says how common the vulnerability is. And then there's maybe a, a bit of a value judgment on, on how serious that is. Um, but the other thing that's kind of really important here is if you fixed all of these top 10 issues in your application, that doesn't mean that you have no risk. It doesn't mean that you have no vulnerabilities. In fact, there are some, which we'll see in a second, that have dropped off the current top 10 list, but that were in the previous list. They're still very much around. They're just not considered the 10 most serious. So... You know, the top 10 is just a starting point and is not actually necessarily the the most important vulnerabilities that you have in your application. So we might talk about three or four vulnerabilities and you say, well, you know, that's not even an issue for us because we don't use those particular techniques or technologies. So there might be other things in your application that you need to think about much more importantly than the top 10. But the top 10 still really is a nice starting point to understand, you know, the, the real biggies that you can cross off your list um, relatively easily, usually relatively quickly. Then you can concentrate on maybe some of the more fringe cases. Now, some of these might not be risks because of your existing design. So you might already have designed in a particular mechanism, a particular control, that means that, for example, SQL injection isn't an issue for you, even though it is for, uh, you know, for most people or most web applications in the world. And in the same way, the framework you've chosen, so for example, the newer versions of the .NET framework, have a number of controls built into the framework, which are switched on by default. So unless you've gone out of your way to turn them off, then you know that they're going to work however you should always consider these top 10 risks as well as others towards secure development because it's very easy to switch something off even if it was just while you were testing something you forgot to turn it on in production or you might have had to turn off a, a feature that you didn't really understand to make something work and actually, if you revisited that now, you might go, oh, wow, I, I never should have switched that off. I need to do things differently. So you need to actually consider for your own organization, for your own development work, how is it that you're going to both implement these from the beginning, but how are you going to review them? How are you going to look back at things you've already written and, and ask if they are vulnerable or whether they need work done as well? But as I say, top 10, great starting point. If you kind of understand the top 10 and how they work, then you'll be a, you know, a good way on your way to understanding web application security in general.
So we've already talked a bit about how the list is produced. So a call goes out from OWASP to say, right, we're ready to create the next list. Please submit your numbers. Obviously, people don't have to, but they choose to do that because they want to help other people. So industries, uh, companies that do this for a living, that, that, ten, that pen test, that code review, that advise and that see a lot of applications in a given year will send their numbers to OWASP. And, and those numbers are obviously anonymous, but they would say, well, we found, you know, 20,000 applications had SQL injection vulnerabilities, 10,000 had cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, etc. So that data is basically collated to produce the frequency of each risk. In other words, how common does this risk actually happen? So part of the risk assessment is then made on that frequency. How frequent is it? How easy is it to exploit? Because if something's very easy to exploit, that makes it more serious than something that actually takes a lot of work or a lot of things to be lined up in order to take advantage of. So these numbers are only measured between one and three. So they're not very controversial. But, you know, an exploitability of three would be, look, that's really easy to exploit. That's that's kind of really serious. The detectability. So detectability is useful for people testing things, but it's also useful for an attacker. So if an attacker can easily detect that your site is um, is vulnerable to SQL injection, for example, then clearly they're more likely to spend time then trying to work on an exploit to actually get past maybe some of the defences, some of the controls you have that might work in most cases, but they might then work out a way of getting past those controls simply because they've detected that you're vulnerable. So that's also taken into the mix. And then the impact or the outcome, whichever you want to call it, is measured in terms of the technical impact, because clearly the business impact depends very much on the data that you're holding. So if you had a site like a hospital and the data got stolen because of a SQL injection attack, for example, clearly that's a lot more serious to the business than if a small company that just had maybe names and addresses was was hacked and that data was breached. So although the technical impact would be the same in both cases, which would be very significant, the business outcome is up to your organization to decide on. And then one of the things that's changed a bit recently is this idea that, well, we don't just want to react to things as we see them now. Because if we do that, we might always be fighting a losing battle. Um, what the community, the OWASP, the people on the OWASP mailing list were asked to do was to say, well, in your opinion, what is a vulnerability that might not be very common now, but is probably going to become a problem due to the trends in the industry, due to new technologies, new frameworks, whether it's Internet of Things, whether it's, um, I don't know, the, the payment regulations in Europe or, or whatever it might be, you know, what are things that we should actually put in the list now so that people can proactively put in a control so that these things will never become a problem in the future? So all of those things will kind of put together and produce the OWASP top 10 for 2017. As I say, it wasn't formally approved until... Uh, 2018 but the list was started in 2017 uh, and they are a1 is the a1 is just a number that gets allocated for it injection we often talk about SQL injection but there are other less common forms of injection as well broken authentication in other words any way in which somebody can pretend to be somebody else any kind of sensitive data exposure so that could be um, direct object references. It could be just a, any way in which somebody can see data that they shouldn't be allowed to see. So that's generally an authorization kind of issue. Then we have a new one, XML external data entities. We'll look at that in a future video, but effectively it's abusing the way that XML parsers can inject external information into an XML document and use that to actually do something that you're, you don't want to happen on your site. Broken access control. So this is a, a common one as well. This is to do with authorization again. This is how do I make sure that only the relevant people can access the relevant parts of the site. 
A very generic one at A6 still. This was in the previous list as well. This is security misconfiguration, which really means a number of different things, but it, it alludes more generally to the setup of the server and the hosting more than it relates to actually a code development itself, although there are elements of code development as well. A7, we've seen it quite frequently before, is cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. A8 is another new one, and this is about deserializing objects. Now that APIs are more common, we see data getting sent kind of across devices quite readily. And of course, in the same way that injection assumes user input is trustworthy and then causes something bad to happen, a similar kind of issue occurs if we deserialize things without a, a, some kind of trust mechanism in place. We risk deserializing data that an attacker has either inserted or, or changed or modified to actually have an, an undesirable effect. Then A9, again, was in there before. Components with known vulnerabilities. Clearly, if you have a component with an unknown vulnerability, then there's not really any way you're going to know that. So that's kind of excusable. But if you're using older versions of web server software, older versions of libraries that have known vulnerabilities on the CVE databases, then you obviously present not only a vulnerability in general, but the actual way of exploiting that is often public information because people have disclosed the vulnerability, which makes it easier for an attacker if they know you're running that um, version of, of a vulnerable component to take advantage of that and attack. And then A10 is kind of a roll up of a number of things we'll look at in a second, but basically saying we're well, insufficient login and monitoring. The slight awkwardness with this is this isn't so much a vulnerability as a lack of a control but it's felt fairly strongly that one of the, the main weapons you have if your site does get attacked is being able to see via login and monitoring what's actually happening. Because if you don't have sufficient login and monitoring, then what's happened is somebody could be attacking your site for months or even years. And that's actually happened recently in a number of high profile cases. It's been happening for a long, long time because nobody spotted it. So although it's a control rather than a vulnerability, it's considered important enough to make the top 10 list of OWASP. The new entries we've already mentioned, external XML entities, we'll see that in a later video. Insecure deserialization again is a new one and in insufficient login and monitoring. Significantly, A8 and A10 came from community feedback rather than from the numbers that came back from the testing companies. And what that is implying is, well, insufficient login and monitoring is not really something you're going to see in a code review. It's not really something you're going to necessarily see in a pen test. But the community is saying this is really important. And the same with deserialization. We're saying, well, we're not really seeing it now, but it's starting to happen so much more than it did before that this will become a problem soon if we don't do something about it now. So they are the new entries. In terms of removed entries, so cross-site request forgery, I think, went down to like number 11 or number 12. So it's still there. It's just not considered significant. And that's mainly because most frameworks have cross-site request forgery built in. Most of the time it's switched on by default because most of the time it doesn't cause a problem. So it's not the kind of feature that people are going to be turning off because it's affecting, you know, affecting other things. So it's generally relatively easy to fix. You put usually put an anti-forgery token in a form that goes back to the framework. The framework checks it to make sure it's valid. And that proves that it's come from the, the right request and not from a different site. So that tends to be less significant now. Un unvalidated redirects and forwards, they're still relatively common, but apparently most of the ones that are found tend to be fairly low risk. They don't tend to be a problem for the site that has the unvalidated redirect implemented. They tend to be just used as a mechanism for a phishing attack to use your site to make it look like their site is legitimate. So that's arguably not a significant risk to the site that has the vulnerability. But again, that's kind of gone down the list. And then when I produced the previous list of OWASP top 10, 
and I was looking at insecure direct references and missing function level access control, uh, I was slightly confused because it felt like I was saying the same thing twice. And that's been recognized now because although what's actually happening is described in, in slightly different ways, the actual underlying problem is the same. And it's really about access control. It's about saying, if I'm referencing an object directly, I need to have access control. And if I'm accessing some kind of functionality, I need function level access control. So those have been merged, which makes a lot of sense because, um, yeah, you just get, get rid of two that are basically the same thing. We need to quickly address the what we would call the controversy of the OWASP Top 10. When it was released initially in 2017, there was a release candidate. It went out for comment. And this was really the sticking point, A7, insufficient attack protection. Now, the issue here, this is a little bit like A10 in the approved list, which is about insufficient logging and monitoring, is it's not so much a risk as a control, which, again, if this was considered really significant, that alone wouldn't be a problem. But it, on top of that, the suggestions came from a vendor who happened to produce uh, an attack protection product. So, of course, it was a bit like, oh, that seems a bit of a conflict of interest. You've got these people basically saying, oh, can you put this on the list so that every, you know, so that everyone will buy my product? Not that everybody would buy the product, but that was the, the, the danger of it. And this was one of those cases where the trustworthiness of the list was at stake, because what we didn't want to think is, right, that's it. Oh, what's top 10 is dead because, um, you know, there's a vendor basically putting their opinions into it. Now, the actual idea itself is not a terrible idea. Like logging and monitoring, having attack protection is a good idea. Personally, I wouldn't say it's um, in the top 10. I wouldn't say it's that serious because very few of our sites are a realistic target for DDoS attacks. And a lot of our cloud infrastructure uh, has that protection built in. So personally, I wouldn't say it's a big deal. The other problem is because this was a kind of community feedback, then there wasn't really any data to back up the fact that this was a really serious issue. So you could say X number of sites have been attacked, but clearly most people's sites don't get DDoSed. So you could say the data doesn't really back up its inclusion. Uh, the other issue is that it's a backstop rather than a preventative measure. So it's not necessarily something you're saying to a developer. If you do this thing the right way, then you will avoid your vulnerability being taken advantage of. But in this case, what we're kind of saying is whatever you do is not going to be good enough um, and you're not going to stop DDoS. So let's just chuck this in as a control. So also doesn't really fit in with the idea of the top 10. Uh, because, yeah, the developer good practice. And it was defended by some people there. You can find on the Internet, if you're interested, the kind of the rebuttals from people who said, well, yeah, you know, I know people are saying this, but it's still, you know, really important. But despite that, ultimately, I think it was um, Andrew van der Stock who basically said, look, you know, for, for the sanity of the list, for people to keep trusting it, we're going to have to remove it and replace it with something else. So that was taken out of the top 10. As I say, it's not a bad idea if you're a big site, if you can afford a bit of cloud flare protection or, you know, a service like that. Microsoft Azure has it. I'm pretty sure AWS has it as well. Great, then do it. But it's not really a top 10 thing. And then in terms of using it, this is all in the document. Again, the reason that link keeps coming up, go and find the PDF document, read the read the stuff at the top. There is a couple of pages of just kind of ideas. But really, as I said before, it's a good starting point, but it's not the end. The top 10 is really a almost like your idiot's guide to web app security. So it doesn't cover everything um, necessarily. But, you know, there are definitely more than 10 risks and there might be things that are specific to your industry or your application that are not present generally in industry. So there will be things that are significant for you which are not on this list, which you would you possibly already know about, but you would need to look into that. There are some other publications that are very useful. I found the cheat sheets that OWASP produce very easy they're effectively checklists so you some of them you can put into your secure development life cycle and say well these are things that the architect has to tick and once they're ticked that's it they don't need to be checked again 
Others should go in a code review checklist because they might say, right, for this new piece of code, have you validated input? Have you made sure that the you know cross-site request forgery token is valid or whatever those things might be? So the cheat sheets are really useful. Some of the items on there won't be relevant, but that's fine. Go through them, tick them off, check it, and you can actually achieve fairly good conformity if you already have a reasonable security culture without doing a great deal of work and especially on more modern frameworks a lot of this stuff now has just become normal the developer's guide is a bit more kind of long-winded and it's been written by a couple of different people i've helped with one of the chapters on there but it's kind of fallen a little bit behind because in in some ways the 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 development information is the same as it's been for years it's have a process keep in touch with the top 10 get your training go to your conferences so it's it's kind of not really a lot to else to say uh, but you know there's a lot of information in there to have a look at if you are a a corporate um company or an organization that deals with high regulate regulatory environments or military environments or whatever then the application security verification standard it sounds complicated it's not particularly complicated is a way of basically providing some kind of objective measure of how good the security is on your application by warrant of the fact that you have a secure process you have manual checking you have code review checklists you have whatever it is and then you can say oh this is an asvs level three application and that can say something to another organization when in most cases we each have our own standards we have our own idea of what is and isn't secure which doesn't translate across company whereas with the asvs you can use that to say yeah level three means level three that that's all cool other things keep up to date the world does move on not massively quickly in terms of these vulnerabilities because a lot of them are the same that's worrying in one sense because it means that we're still not really learning the lessons we're still not using secure development life cycles is honestly not hard it starts with a document with five items on it and then every time you look into your code and you do stuff, you go, oh, actually, I should be checking this every time somebody changes the code or that thing's not relevant anymore. I'm going to cross that off. Create it. Once you start creating it, it kind of makes sense. Every time something goes wrong and you miss something, add it to the list. You know, it's just t it takes five seconds and it can save you, well, literally millions of pounds in in losses, in lost customer satisfaction, in orders, in you know fines and whatever else and i think really the 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 bottom line don't wait to fail and sadly that seems to be the narrative of certainly larger companies is they theoretically spend money on security and then they fail on really really basic stuff that that they've screwed up you know don't wait to do that be proactive a lot of these things i keep saying it they're very simple to implement if you know even a, a small bit about coding about programming these things are not, they're not rocket science input validation is not rocket science it's just having it in place making it a deliberate choice and then verifying that it's being done and i just leave you with this please read the top 10 publication it's uh, online it's free it's a pretty good read it's not very long it's not going to you know hurt your brain and just yeah pop to the OWASP top 10 site you can google it quite easily and i will see you in the next video which will be about injection